It is an amazing thing to launch a rocket. It's even more amazing if on top of that rocket is a spacecraft that's going to travel millions of miles out into space and encounter a small, rocky asteroid. But you are in a whole new dimension. If that spacecraft then lands on that asteroid, collects a sample, and returns it back here to Earth. That's what the OSIRIS-REx mission did. The asteroid's name was Bennu. And the human being who is most responsible for making that happen is our next speaker. It is my honor to present to you on the Starmus Earth stage, Dante Loretta. Today, I want to take you on a journey, a journey that I've been on for 20 years, but in many ways, the journey that is all of us. It's a journey seeking answers to the most profound questions we ask ourselves. Where did we come from? Why is Earth this beautiful, habitable jewel that we've inherited? And are we alone in this universe? Our journey started in an environment very much like you see on the screen here. This is the Carina Nebula, as imaged by the James Webb Space Telescope. It's a stellar nursery. What you see at the bottom is a giant molecular cloud dominated by the most fundamental atoms that originated shortly after the dawn of the universe hydrogen, and helium, with trace amounts of critical compounds essential for life. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, phosphorus, and a host of trace ions and metals. Off the field of view, there is a giant star pumping out intense amounts of ultraviolet and X-ray radiation, and it's sculpting the cloud very much like geology, leaving behind the denser regions. Inside those pillars, new stars are being born. And it looks very much like this. As that cloud collapses, a property of physics called angular momentum is conserved. And some of the material, which doesn't fall into the central growing young star, spins out into a protoplanetary disk. It is in this environment that the very first compounds that went on to make the Earth, the other planets, their moons, the remnant asteroids, and on one special place, life. When we try to understand the origin of Earth as a habitable world, we're confounded with a puzzle. Earth formed very close to that growing star in an environment that was very hot. Water was in the gas phase. There was no ice, there was no liquid. Carbon, the central element of life, was in a similar state. The surface of the planet was bombarded by asteroids. It was a hot, hellish environment. In some cases, the impacts were so large, it spalled off enough material to create the moon. So the question is, where did the water come from that makes up our oceans, our rivers, and our bodies? Where did the organic material come from that is central to all life on Earth? We flew a mission seeking those questions, seeking answers to those questions. And we think that they had to come from far out in the early solar system where water ice was stable, Carbon ices were stable, nitrogen ices were stable, and at the end of that process, those givers of life came into the inner solar system, creating the beautiful habitable world that we know today, and somehow triggering the origin of life, a process that started 3.8 billion years ago 
and has continued nonstop throughout the entire history of our planet. The object of our mission is a near-Earth asteroid named Bennu. And you can see its orbital diagram here on the screen. The Earth is in blue. The other terrestrial planets are white. And Bennu is orange. This object was chosen originally out of engineering practicality. We needed a place that we could launch off the Earth, rendezvous, spend some time, map, collect a sample, and bring it back. We don't think Bennu originated here. In fact, we know it's not stable. This is what we call a cosmic game of pinball. Bennu keeps getting bounced around by the terrestrial planets. Within 10 million years, it's either going to fall into the sun or potentially crash into one of those other objects. This is what Bennu looks like. It's a relatively small world, about 500 meters across, comparable to a large building like the Empire State Building in New York City. Even though it's small in stature, its scientific potential is immense. After all the engineering constraints were satisfied, there were several objects that we could send our spacecraft to. We chose Bennu because it is one of the darkest objects in the solar system. With a surface so black, it only reflects 4% of the sunlight that imparts its surface. We intuited that this dark nature meant carbon. That's one element that we know can make something so black and so dark. So we hoped, based on that simple telescopic information, they would hold the keys to these key questions that we've been asking. It's also got this nearly spherical shape, highly unusual for such a small body. Now we know it turns out to be relatively common with these small piles of rubble. And that's really what we're looking at here. These are boulders, gravel, and dust that were once part of a much larger body that existed farther out in the solar system, and it was catastrophically disrupted in a giant impact on the order of a billion years ago. This is basically like a droplet of rock, many thousands of which were created in that catastrophic event many, many years ago. So we built this amazing robotic explorer called OSIRIS-REx to go out to Bennu to collect material from its surface and bring it back to the Earth. We put it on top of the mighty Atlas rocket, and on September 8th of 2016, on a cloudless, beautiful day in Florida, we launched this vehicle on its journey. It turns out the ease of getting to Bennu means it also can get to us. We now know its orbit so well that we can predict it will fly in between the Earth and the Moon in the year 2135. But what it does after that is still a mystery because there's a phenomena called the Yarkovsky effect. It's so dark, it absorbs that sunlight, it gets really hot, and as it rotates into its night, it throws that energy back out into space as infrared radiation, imparting a small thrust and depending on the nuances and details, it may impact the Earth on September 24th, 2182. And because of our mission, we know there's about a 0.057% chance of that happening. The survey around Bennu was a marvel of astrodynamics. Here you can see the path that the spacecraft flew over two years in proximity to our asteroid. We would go into orbit, we would leave orbit. Microgravity lets you do amazing things with your spacecraft. We zipped back and forth, taking pictures at just the right lighting conditions and just the right angles to get a detailed map of its surface, constantly seeking a safe location to send this beautiful spacecraft down to collect that material. We call this our web around Bennu. And we left in May of 2021. When we got there, it was quite a surprise. We had thought we were going to a beach. All of our astronomical data had convinced us the surface was smooth and flat, and it was gonna be easy. Here you see towering boulders like our gargoyle, 15 meters tall, dominating the surface of this asteroid. This is Ben Ben, 
the largest, tallest asteroid, over 40 meters in height, bigger than a 10-story building. We never dreamed such behemoths were present on the surface. It looked like an apocalyptic landscape. And I can tell you, the team was freaked out. How are we possibly ever going to get our spacecraft down to the surface of this asteroid to safely collect a sample? Well, it turns out we had to make the spacecraft smarter. We invented a technology called natural feature tracking. We did exquisite 3D mapping of the surface, helped very much by our science team member, Sir Brian May. We found a crater about 20 meters across that we called the Nightingale, much smaller than our original guidance accuracy of 50 meters. We made the spacecraft so smart it could get into some place 10 meters across. But even there, there were still hazards. Even though we had done a five-fold improvement in the spacecraft's ability to guide itself, so we had to give it autonomy. We had to let OSIRIS-REx make its own decision when it's coming down to make contact with the surface. Is it safe? Continue? Is it hazardous? Because of microgravity, you can fire those thrusters and back away. Fortunately, that all worked great. And on October 20th of 2020, we sent the spacecraft down for a brief contact, shockingly hitting a fluid-like surface with the robotic arm sinking in over 50 centimeters. We got that sample tucked away into a return capsule. After a two and a half year journey back to the Earth, it came searing through the Utah sky on September 24th of 2023. And I can't tell you how much relief I felt when I heard that that main parachute had opened and that capsule had safely landed in the Utah desert. Very quickly, we shipped it off to NASA's Johnson Space Center, where our crack curation team was waiting in a custom-built laboratory to disperse that sample out of its sample collector and get ready to distribute it to scientists all around the world so we could go after these key questions, ending what was, for me, 20 years of intense effort thinking about nothing except getting that sample off the surface of the asteroid and back to our laboratories on Earth. Thank you. Yeah, that was a good day. Of course, there's a lot more details to that adventure. So I invite you to either take a pictorial guide. After it was all said and done, Brian and I sat down, and he and his collaborator, Claudia Manzoni, had processed dozens and dozens of images of the surface in stereo so we could see it in glorious 3D, searching for that one smooth location. And so we decided we had to put all that together. And with the help of the London Stereoscopic Company and the University of Arizona Press, we put out the Bennu 3D book. And I tell my story from a young kid growing up in the wilds of the Arizona desert without a TV, without running water, to becoming the leader of this amazing NASA mission in the Asteroid Hunter. The mission requirement was to bring back 60 grams of material. By the time we got it out of that collector and dispersed across these trays, we realized we had done more than twice as much, 121.6 grams of Bennu material pristine, carbonaceous material from the dawn of the solar system was now in our laboratories and available for scientific investigation. And for the first time in a long time, I got to stop thinking like a manager or an engineer, and I got to start thinking again like a scientist to go back to those inspirational questions that drove me to pursue to the ends of the solar system this fine sample. So I went back to the document that we wrote, the final proposal to NASA in 2010, after six years of revising and trying to convince the agency to fly the program. And what we wrote was that analyses of these samples provide unprecedented knowledge about pre-solar history, like those giant molecular clouds that I showed you, through the initial stages of planet formation, planetary accretion, to the origin of life. And I looked at that last set of three words, and I said, did I really promise unprecedented knowledge about the origin of life? 
I said, all that other stuff is easy. We know how to analyze pre-solar grains. We've already found them. They've formed in supernova outflows and giant branch stars, solar system formation, planetary formation, asteroid evolution, even the origin of what we call Earth volatiles, the water, the carbon, the organics. That's the easy part. The origin of life, that's a real challenge. And after OSIRIS-REx, I was looking for something to do. So let's take a look at what we got. I'm going to show you some electron microscope images of some of the beautiful minerals that are in there. I grew up in the desert, and one of my favorite things to do was go find old mining operations, dig through the tailings piles, looking for the little piece of the ore that they were mining, the treasure. We have brought back treasure from Bennu. Most of the material looks like these images here. They're very fibrous materials. Notice the tiny scale bars over there on the left. That's five microns. You take a meter, you divide it up into a million pieces, and that's a micron. Two and a half microns on the right. It's kind of like asbestos. We call that serpentine. It's a mineral that has a snake-like habit to it. These are clay minerals and they are loaded with water. They form when rock reacts with water. It's not water as ice, it's not water as liquid, it's water locked up inside the crystal structure of the clays. And these make up about 70 to 80% of the volume of the sample. Bennu is soaking wet. Great, it is the kind of object that we wanted to go to. This is the kind of asteroid that likely delivered the water in our oceans, in our lakes, our rivers, our rain clouds, and our bodies. So just think about that for a minute. All the water in you, you know, I have a bathroom scale, tells me my percent body water, about 54, 55%. All of that water probably came to the earth in these fibrous clay minerals billions of years ago. Carbon. The sample is almost 5% by weight carbon, a gold mine for astrobiology. Most of the carbon is in organic material. Over there on the left, outlined in the dashed yellow, is a vein of kind of tar-like material. Very, very organic rich, highly processed samples. Some of it is in the mineral phase, like over on the right. That's a mineral called calcite. It's a carbonate mineral. You might be familiar with it if you live in an area with hard water and you get those crusty white deposits building up around your faucets or as my UK friends would say, your taps. That means the water on Bennu was soda water. It was carbonated. The carbon was in the fluid. It was moving through the system, changing the minerals, making clays, and ultimately depositing carbon-8 minerals. We see iron in the form of oxides. Here's a couple different really beautiful morphologies. Over there on the left, we call these the framboids, after the French word frambois for raspberries. Raspberries of iron oxide. Magnetite, better known as the lodestone, the magnetic mineral. Plaquettes or platelets over there on the right. This is fascinating because these minerals are known to be what we call chemical catalysts for organic molecules. They make reactions go faster. That means you can produce key organic materials much more rapidly than if these minerals weren't present. The other beautiful crystalline forms that we see are iron sulfides. You may know these as pyrite or fool's gold, very brassy kind of minerals. These are similar, not quite as sulfur rich. We call them pyrotites. They make these beautiful hexagonal platelets. You can see the one over there on the right. It's got a kind of a layering structure. One of the most exciting results from these minerals so far is that as we go inside them, they actually have little droplets of the fluid trapped inside the mineral, what we would call a fluid inclusion. So not only do we have most of that water in the clay, we have it locked up inside the minerals as well. The sulfides also great organic molecule catalysts. So we have factories for making organic molecules in an aqueous environment from the dawn of our solar system. So if we think about the minerals, clays, carbonates, oxides, sulfides, if you're a terrestrial geologist, this might sound kind of familiar. 
because they form in environments that we know about. The one that surprises us is a few of the particles have this bright white material on its surface here. You can see it in the upper left there. These are phosphates, phosphorus, essential element for life. It makes up the backbone of our DNA and our RNA. It makes up the membranes of our cells. It is the energy that all life uses on Earth through the ATP molecule. All of that looks a lot like an environment that we have here right on Earth at the bottom of the ocean, hydrothermal vents, especially what we call the white smokers or the alkaline hydrothermal vents, carbonated water reacting with rocks from the mantle of the Earth, producing the clays, producing the carbonates, producing the oxides, the sulfides. So what we have is a sample of an ancient ocean world very much like we see in the outer solar system today. This is an iconic image taken by NASA's Cassini spacecraft when it was in orbit around Saturn. And it flew by a tiny moon called Enceladus. The sun was backlit and we saw these amazing geysers erupting from the south pole of this fascinating object. There's a liquid ocean underneath that crust of ice, heated by the gravitational tidal tug of the giant Saturn. Bennu looks like it might have come not only from a world very much like this, but from a location in the solar system very similar. In order to get the carbon, in order to get, well, I'll show you the nitrogen, it had to be really cold, colder than water ice, where you would make dry ice and ammonia ices. All of those were swept up into Bennu's parent asteroid, maybe a little smaller than Enceladus, about half the size. Enceladus is about 500 kilometers across. We think Bennu's parent was maybe half that or smaller. But nevertheless, there was radioactivity early in the solar system. It melted those ices. They reacted with the rocks. They made the organics. They made the minerals that we see there today. An amazing treasure trove of information. And because it's sample return, it'll be available for decades into the future where people will be much smarter than we are with much better scientific instruments and they can build on all the knowledge that we've gained so far. So how does that help us get to the origin of life? This is kind of the idea that's been floating around in science for over 70 years, going back to a famous experiment called the Miller-Urey experiment. So we have basic molecules that are all over the universe, water, ammonia, methane, hydrogen sulfide and phosphates, that's easy. And then they have to turn into interesting what we call prebiotic molecules, things that existed before life did. The nucleobases, the letters of our genetic code. The amino acids, the building blocks of our proteins. The lipids, the walls that make up cell membranes so that you can isolate the system from its environment. Those have to form chains, long strings of molecules. We call that polymerization. The nucleobases have to bond with sugar and phosphate to make nucleic acids and become information-bearing molecules. The proteins have to polymerize so that they can fold up into very specific structures to perform the functions that they do in our bodies today. And then somehow, and we have no idea how, all of that comes together and you have the fundamental unit of life, a living cell. Miller-Urey experiment was almost 70 years ago, and our biotechnology has progressed by enormous leaps and bounds, yet we still have no idea how you go from something that's inanimate, like an asteroid, to something that's alive. Something is missing in our knowledge right now, and this is what I'm a quest to find. A hint comes from looking at the asteroid sample. Here we just took a tiny dust particle. Notice the 50 micron scale bar. Doesn't look that special in reflected light. You can see the shiny bits. That's where those sulfides are. But when we look at it under ultraviolet light, it fluoresces. Something in there is glowing. You can see these little yellow dots speckled throughout. Fluorescence, that's interesting. What could that possibly be? 
If we go in with the electron microscope, we see those glowing yellow fluorescent dots are spheres, 100 nanometers up to a micron across, looking for all the world like maybe something you would find in biology. When we go in with a more powerful electron microscope, a transmission electron microscope, we can see their structure and we can see their composition. Over there on the right, red is carbon, green is silicon, that's those clay minerals, and blue is iron, that's the oxide right there. This looks like a cell wall or a membrane. It's isolated itself from its environment, and this one looks like it might even be splitting into two. Is there something happening here? Maybe. So back to our diagram, what have we found so far? In Bennu, we have all the basic molecules of life, the water, the ammonia, the carbon. We have prebiotic molecules. Life uses four nucleobases for the letters of the genetic code and DNA. RNA uses three of those and swaps out a new one. So there's five nucleobases used by life. All five of those are in the asteroid sample. Life uses 20 amino acids to build our proteins. So far, we found 13 of them. And we have those nanoglobules that look all the world like lipids and cell membranes. No DNA, no proteins, and no living cells just yet. But the building blocks of life are ubiquitous. Not only did the Earth get them, but these asteroids delivered this material to Venus, delivered it to Mars, to the icy satellites of the outer solar system. All the planets had the opportunity to become alive. And we don't know which ones did and which ones do not. We know for sure it only happened on one. But a lot of our exploration, like we've heard about this week, is seeking life elsewhere in the solar system and in planets beyond ours. As I thought, what could we be missing? I came across a field called quantum biology. And I was like, information. Claude Shannon, the father of information theory, defined information as the resolution of uncertainty. Where does uncertainty exist in physics? In the quantum realm. The wave function is a distribution of possibilities, of probabilities. And then somehow, when a conscious observer looks at the system, it collapses and becomes classical, the physics that we all know and experience every day. It turns out this is becoming a hot topic in biology. Plants use quantum superposition every time they capture a particle of light from the sun, giving photosynthesis almost 100% efficiency, more than three times what we get from our solar panels today. Enzymes use this to make special molecules using quantum tunneling. And perhaps the, my favorite, the poster animal for quantum biology, the European robin, has pairs of entangled protons in its eyes, in its retina, that allows it to see and sense the strength in the direction of Earth's magnetic field. Life is harnessing quantum weirdness. So maybe the missing element is in this funky physics that baffles our notions about how reality really works. As I went deeper, I came across some work on quantum processes in proteins in our brains led by Nobel laureate Sir Roger Penrose and fellow Arizona wildcat Stuart Hameroff, proposing that these protein structures called microtubules, which run down the axons and dendrites of our neurons, and in fact exist in all complex life forms, eukaryotic life forms, plants, fungi, protists, they all have these microtubules. And, there, and I said, well, maybe something related to quantum consciousness is at play here. And a lot of my colleagues think this, okay, this is, now you've gone too far, right? Consciousness, there's no way consciousness is involved in the origin of life. But you know, we heard from Jane Goodall that when she started her research, nobody believed the chimpanzees were conscious. Now, all of our ethical guidelines for animal testing insist mammals are conscious and they suffer and we need to consider their suffering in our pursuit of science. They have a rich inner world. Recently, a group of scientists put out a proposal saying the cephalopods, like the octopus and the mollusk, are conscious. 
So you can't just test on them without considering how they feel. And just in the past couple of months, groups of scientists have said insects are conscious because when they give honeybees a little bit of ball, they play with it. They're having fun with it. There's no reason why they would be behaving that we have come up with so far. Insects are conscious. My friend Stuart is an anesthesiologist, and he says consciousness is what goes away when you're under anesthesia, and it comes back when you wake up. I just saw a presentation a couple weeks ago showing jellyfish go to sleep. What is the jellyfish doing when it wakes up? Is it conscious? So we don't know, and we're afraid in the scientific community to talk about it because we don't understand it, and our arrogance has led us for many millennia to say we are the only conscious. And I would say some people said only old white men with big gray beards are conscious. We know that's not true. So could it be the core of the origin of life is consciousness? What that would mean is you need to find a system capable of undergoing collapse of the wave function. I show three amino acids on the bottom there. They're, they're unique because they have that ring, that six-sided hexagon. That's called an aromatic ring. And that aromatic ring is the cause of fluorescence. It grabs a photon, a particle of light. It puts it into quantum superposition and then releases it sometime later. The key in the Hameroff Penrose world is the amino acid tryptophan over there on the bottom right corner. And when I look at that, that looks kind of familiar. It's a precursor to serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter. It helps us relax. It's also central to all the psychedelic molecules like psilocybin, LSD, and DMT. And we don't know how those work. So if anesthesia turns it off and psychedelics ramp it up, maybe there's something in these very simple molecules that hold the key to the origin of life. In Bennu, we have the phenylalanine. We might have the tyrosine, and we don't have the tryptophan. And tryptophan may have come into life very much later. So what do I mean by consciousness? It's, it's this abstract idea, I know what it is, you know what it is, but in a scientific way, can we define it? There was a couple definitions that just came out that I like. Hartmut Nevin, who's the vice president at Google Quantum AI, building the world's greatest quantum computers, says consciousness is how a system experiences the emergence of a unique classical reality. Santosh Helikar, who's building a consciousness detector to help to understand if people in coma states are conscious, says consciousness involves modulated spontaneous conversion of waves into particles or collapse of the quantum wave function of electrons, protons, or ions. This is something that we can work with. What are we looking for? We're looking for molecules that can put ions, photons, electrons into a quantum superposition state and have that state collapse to a classical reality. Penrose would say that is a moment of consciousness in the universe as it goes from this uncertainty to a definitive realm. And this may be happening billions of times in our mind. Up there is a very complicated molecule that we extracted from a meteorite many years ago. And it's full of different types of structures that are well known in pharmacology. We've recently done simulations to show what it would look like in three dimensions. And it makes those helical tubular structures very much like those microtubules that we see at the heart of the Penrose Hameroff model for consciousness. We're able to see how they harness radiation. Here is an electric field on the left and a magnetic field on the right. This molecule will cycle that energy around in a quantum uncertain state until the system collapses. It's capable of entering into the kind of physical state that the consciousness researchers suggest. So I'm going to leave you with where are we going with all of this? We're putting forward this bold idea that most people are going to think is ridiculous, just like the researchers thought the chimpanzees being conscious was ridiculous, that maybe it's consciousness that provides the motivation for these molecules to self-organize. Because when a system collapses, you get a feeling. And the molecule may respond to it. 
It may be able to sense its environment. It may be able to harness quantum information, use that to enhance its survivability. So after 20 years, I've been privileged to touch the stars, to bring a piece of them back to the Earth, seeking answers to the most profound questions that we ask ourselves. And I've come to realize that maybe, just maybe, the final pieces of the puzzle lie within. Thank you.